Well, good evening. And isn't it just an absolutely gorgeous day out today? This is Wednesday, uh, around 1.45, and uh, getting ready for this Bible study tonight. It's just too nice to do anything inside today. So I'm spending some time out here in my backyard. Uh, the grass needs mowed. I'll probably get to that when I'm done with this Bible study. Uh, but it's just so nice out here. Uh, you can see the a weary funeral home behind me and my house. And uh, But what really is gorgeous to look at is the sky. Oh my goodness. It's so blue. Look at those clouds just drifting on by. I hope you're able to pay attention uh, while we do Bible study. Uh, and don't let the background scenery uh, distract you too much from what we're doing today. But we're going to finish... Uh, with uh, part two of images of the church uh, in our image series. We did images of, of Jesus Christ, uh, the image of Christ uh, in scripture, and we did images of the church part one uh, last week. This is part two. Last week, just to refresh your memory, we did uh, the bride of Christ. We did the, how the church, well, we are the branches. Uh, Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. We did the flock of God, or the sheep of his pasture. Uh, and we did uh, the, uh, the family of God, how we are uh, part of God's family, and then how we are uh, part of the kingdom of, of God. And so those are just different ways that the scripture describes the body of Christ. And, and it's not that those are convenient images uh, that that God wants us to say, well, it's kind of like this. No, he said, that's what you are. These are all uh, uh, characteristics of the church, not just uh, convenient analogies. You remember how and I, I spoke of how a basketball can be used to describe the, the planet Earth, um, but very limited, you know? So it's like a, it's an, al it's a, an analogy of convenience. But if I were to uh, hold up a globe that's not an analogy of convenience. The globe is specifically designed to teach you about the earth. And so when we say that, that uh, the church is the bride of Christ, it's, uh, this is one of those things that, that when the scripture talks of us being the bride of Christ, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not an analogy of convenience. It's not where um, he's saying, oh, you know what's a good image to think of in your mind is like a bride. You know, that's, that's one way to think of the church. That's really not what it's trying to, trying to do. What he's saying is uh, that whole bridegroom bride thing is the image of the greater reality. The greater reality is Christ and his church. That bridegroom and bride thing that we do called marriage uh, is meant, it's designed to point towards uh, the bridegroom Jesus and his bride, the church. So uh, it's not... Um, it goes the other way around that we might think. We might think that, oh well, in helping us to understand who the church is, we think of a bride. No, it's when you think of a bride, that its purpose, the whole purpose of a marriage is to point you towards this relationship, this divine relationship that we have with God about how uh, Jesus is the head of the church and we submit to his rule and his authority knowing that he died he gave himself up for us that he serves us and this is what paul teaches that that a marriage is supposed to be based on this that it actually points to that uh, rather than uh, oh well you know maybe this can help us understand uh, I, I don't know if i'm explaining that quite as well as i have it in my head uh, but i hope you catch my drift the first one we're going to talk about today in the images of christ is that uh, and this is one that Paul uses uh, to describe us as a building. Uh, we are a building. We are, uh, he calls us the temple of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. Now a lot of folks will, will think that this is just talking about them. They say, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul's pretty clear. He's using a plural form of you. You know, if we were in Arkansas, it'd be y'all. Uh, uh, if you're reading the King James, it's ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I by myself, David Warren, am not the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay? I just want to make that clear. I am not the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. No one is meant to be a standalone uh, temple of the Holy Spirit. We are not the building in and of ourselves. You can't have church with one. You must have two or more to have a church. And, and that's just fact. We're just going to have to deal with it. And so those people who say, well, your body is a, a temple, I get what they're saying. I understand what they're trying to say. Uh, and, and it's just as equally valid if we just translate it correctly, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am just a portion of that temple. I am a part of that temple. I'm not the sum total of that temple. So I still need to take care of myself. I still need to take care of uh, my soul and, and my heart and my spirit and, and make sure that I'm not uh, taking my, my, my heart into places that it shouldn't go. Uh, because we don't want to say, well, that's just that's not the whole temple, but it's okay if we have mold growing in one corner. No, we don't want mold growing in one corner of the temple. And if that corner is me, I need to make sure that it's clean. I need to make sure that it's stable. I need to make sure that it's strong and it's growing in the image of Christ. So, but I, I want to make that clear that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so if we'll look in, in the scripture... Uh, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. We'll start in verse 19. Again, I'll put the scriptures up on the screen here. Probably, you know what, I'll move over a little bit. That way, I have room to put it up over here. Uh, Ephesians, chapter 2, uh, start in verse 19. Paul writes, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So who's the cornerstone of this building? Jesus, right? In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Uh, so again, Paul's talking in the plural here. This is us together. Uh, but it's also very important for us to always remember that the cornerstone, the foundation, the builder of this house is Jesus. We are the material. We're the ones that he's building out of. Uh, and, and that makes us important. We matter. Uh, but we are not the builders and we are not the foundation. Okay, But we are the building or the temple of God. Uh, the second one we want to look at is the body, okay? The body of Christ. And let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me flip this over here real quick. I should have had it uh, bookmarked, but I didn't. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let's start in verse 12. But this is uh, where Paul... Uh, is, is teaching on how we all matter and we all play a part together. But in verse 12, it says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, through ma though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So, uh, and he goes on to talk about uh, ignoble or noble purposes. Uh, and we sometimes often, you know, I always, I love uh, uh, the, the example of the big toe. Nobody wants to be the big toe of the body of Christ, right? Um, but if you know anything about anatomy, uh, if you don't have your big toe, then you can't walk. And in fact, when kings uh, would take over other kings, one of the things they would do is they'd cut off their thumbs and their toes. This was not just to shame them. This was to make it so they couldn't hold a sword anymore, the opposable thumb, right? But also so they couldn't run uh, and they couldn't chase, they couldn't fight. And so they would basically handicap them. So they were uh, on hands and knees for the rest of their lives, and they were not a threat anymore. And so to be the big toe of the church, while it might not be flashy, 
while it might not get all the attention that, say, the mouth gets, you know, I'm, I'm one of the mouths of the church, and I might get a lot of attention, but the ones that really matter are the big toes. So are you one of those big toes? And if so, nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, you should have that good spiritual pride that comes from God uh, that, that I am a part of the body of Christ and I matter. And I think that's very important for us to hear. Uh, but we are all in this together. We are the body of Christ. The third one we want to look at, we're, it's very familiar, but we want to look at uh, how the church is the salt of the earth. Okay, so turn with me to the Gospels. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus is, is uh, teaching on what it means to be uh, followers of Christ. Again, I should have bookmarked these. I might uh, edit some of this downtime out of the video. Matthew chapter 5 uh, he, he talks about two things. We'll get to both of them, but first let's talk about the salt in, in verse 13. Matthew 5, 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall it, uh, its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And so while he calls us the salt of the earth, and a lot of folks have, have waxed eloquently about what it means to be um, the salt of the earth. Um, but Jesus kind of clarifies that here. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, people have spoken on how we are preservative. Uh, and, but that's not the example Jesus uses. He says if you've lost your, your taste, your tastiness, your flavor, and salt primarily, what do we use it for? We don't use it. Uh, for, for much other than to flavor our, our food. And, and one thing that we need to understand about salt as a flavoring is when you eat something and it tastes too salty, what do you want to do? You want to get it out of your mouth and wash it down. So we don't want to be too salty, right? We also don't want to be too bland. You know, because something that's too bland, the first thing you want to do, wash that thing down, right? It's just the right amount of salt. And we can be led by the Holy Spirit uh, to flavor the gospel in the way that it needs to be flavored. And here's what salt does. Salt is not in itself meant to be a flavoring. What salt does is it enhances the flavor that is already there. It brings it out. It's like an amplifier, right? Uh, if I am uh, singing into a microphone and we have that volume control, now, I can very easily make that too loud and just blow everybody away and they all plug their ears and they're not interested in hearing it. Or I can have it too quiet and then people can uh, strain to hear what it is I'm trying to say and they're actually putting in more effort to listen to me than I am in, in sharing with them. And then that does a disservice as well. But if we have that volume at just the right level, it enhances and it amplifies what I'm saying so that people can actually receive it and enjoy listening to it. That's what it means to be the salt of the earth. Uh, that when we share the, the gospel story, when we share the hope of Jesus Christ, we do it in the right way. Uh, we enhance the flavor. We're not too salty and we're not uh, too bland either. And so we want to have that just that perfect level of saltiness. And that's really who we are. Now the next one, same area in the scripture. We're going to stay right there in Matthew chapter 5, very next verse, verse 14. He says, you are the light of the world. Now a city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Very similar teaching that Jesus is giving us in these verses about being light. Uh, he's not saying uh, you should just shine, 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 shine so brightly that you blind everybody. That's not the goal, okay? Uh, the, and, and, but also, don't be so dim that nobody even notices your light. Okay, so he is still 
talking about the the level of light that we give but it should be bright enough that it attracts people away from the darkness to the light but not so bright that it gets all the attention notice what it says in verse 16 and well verse 15 first it says don't hide it don't make it too dim but let everybody see it give light to everyone but in verse 16 he says let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works but giving glory to the Father. All right. So the, the attention uh, first might go through you, but it's so uh, perfectly lit that it doesn't draw the attention to you. It draws the attention to the Father. Okay. So it, it's still about uh, uh, the balance of the right, the right uh, luminosity, I guess you could say, when it comes to light and the right saltiness when it comes to the salt, okay? We don't want to be overbearing, but we also don't want to shrink back and be uh, timid about who we are in Christ, okay? Uh, the next one we want to look at, the last one we want to look at, uh, and then we're going to move on to uh, uh, something else, but this is uh, fishermen. We are supposed to be uh, fishers, fishermen and fisherwomen, uh, fishers, okay? Anglers, uh, I guess you could say. But Jesus called us to be fishers of people. Uh, he does not want us uh, to, to be uh, uh, those who go around and beat people up, uh, but he wants us to be fishers. So let's look at Matthew chapter 4. Just kick it back one chapter. So I've tried to keep them all real tight together here. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Well, let's start in verse 18. Uh, While Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now we know, of course, they then dropped their nets and they followed Jesus and they became uh, the messengers of the gospel. That's what the word apostle means, is that messenger of the gospel, the sent ones. And uh, so to be a sent one, one sent out with the gospel, and Jesus says, you're a, a fisher of men. Now, I'm not the best angler. I, I, I like to fish, okay? I'm not infatuated. I'm not like uh, so focused on it that that's all I think about. Uh, but I do like to fish. And I like getting out on the water in my kayak and and, uh, and, and fishing, and, but I, I don't have uh, the same luck or skill, uh, whichever is required, uh, that other anglers have. I watch these guys on videos, they really know what they're doing, they know what kind of bait to use, they know exactly where to go fish, they know what time to go fish, uh, and I always seem to either use the wrong bait or the wrong lake or the wrong, you know, I don't know, you know, and I remember the old joke where I come from, in Arkansas is when you ask somebody where's the best place to catch fish around here they always say in the water because there's no way they're giving up their fishing hole okay they've worked hard to find those things uh, but if we're supposed to be fishers of men it's interesting when you see these these professional fishers uh, these anglers they go out there and and they, they put so much work into just getting ready to go fishing right they they buy uh, particular lures they buy a particular uh, filament uh, of a fishing line uh, and, and a particular color and a particular kind of rod a particular kind of reel um, I mean even the glasses that they wear to help them fish I don't know how that works but it does apparently uh, a kind of boat motor uh, just whatever you can think of they're so uh, focused on catching the fish that they've done everything they can uh, in order to have a successful fishing trip. Uh, and, and if they don't know what they're doing, and here's, here's what I think really works uh, for the gospel message. If you don't know what you're doing as a fisher, you might consider hiring, hiring a, a fishing guide. Can you, uh, can you see the, the image there? Uh, who is our fishing guide? Well, that would be the Holy Spirit, right? Um, as we're going out, we want to go and we want to teach people about Jesus. We want to introduce people to the hope of Jesus Christ. Now, you can go out there and you can just like uh, every fish that you see, chase it down and try and uh, shove a hook in its mouth. 
That's how some people do evangelism. That's not what Jesus taught us to do. Uh, or you could say, you know what, I don't know if there are any fish in here, but this is where I like to fish. It's comfortable. There's shade here. I don't have to work real hard. So I'm just going to sh fish right here, uh, and uh, we'll see what we get. You know, Well, that's not, that's, that's not what Christ has called us to do. He's, Christ, he's called us to, to seek out those, those lost. Uh, and so we might need a fishing guide to take us to where the fish are ready to be caught. We might need a fishing guide to take us out there to those places where we don't know there are fish there to be caught. But he knows, okay? And so we need to trust the Holy Spirit to lead us to the right people that we might share our hope with them so that they too might live as hopeful people, as resurrected believers and followers of Jesus Christ. So let me recap real quick on these images, the second set of images of Christ. The first is we are the temple or the building uh, of God. Okay, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit and that was in Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22. We are also the body of Christ and we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 starting in verse 12 there. Uh, we are also the salt of the earth. Not too salty, but not too bland. Uh, and that's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. And then we are also the light of the world. Not too bright, but not too dim. Just the right level of luminosity. Uh, and that's Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, 15, and 16. Then we are also supposed to be the anglers of God. And we're supposed to go out there catching people, uh, but being led by that fishing guide. Uh, the Holy Spirit, who will lead us to the people who need to hear uh, the hope of Jesus Christ. So those are images of the church found in the New Testament. So if you didn't get a chance to watch last week's episode, uh, The Image of the Church, uh, go back and look at that. It's, it's, uh, they go together uh, for us to know who we are in Christ. Uh, but it's important for us to uh, remember the, the very first part of the image series, which is uh, the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, to know who Jesus is, is paramount. Uh, for, for example, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, but we are not the foundation. We are not the builder. The builder of this house is God. The foundation, the cornerstone, is Jesus Christ. We must always keep those things in perspective. Uh, the, to remember that uh, He is King. He is King Jesus. He is the big King. I might be uh, a little K king, but I'm always going to be Pee Wee compared to Jesus Christ. Remember that. I, I can't wait to meet with you again next week for Bible study. I don't know yet uh, what the topic's going to be, but uh, we'll get excited about it anyway, all right? So bless you. Uh, go in peace. Mm -hmm.